morning, everyone. It's a uh, blessing to be here while I get my effects in order and have a bit of preamble. Um, I do send my apologies on behalf of my family, couldn't be here. We we're meant to come here about a month or two ago, and we we're sick then also. And so Kylie was telling me all week, if we're sick, you have to go, you have to go. Praise the Lord, I'm here. Thank you to the church for this opportunity. And also, um, when I first got saved about, I was 18, so what's that, 12 years, 13 years ago, um, the Teshers were there, and then they came out here. The Lord's called them to Bass Coast here to start this church, and then praise the Lord, 11 years later, as you've just had your anniversary, I get the privilege to preach. I'm a man of no significance. I am nothing, but the Lord is everything, and I thank you that I can bring the word for him this morning. Acts chapter 12, um, Pastor Tesh did a really good job of reading the word. Um, it may shock you, we're actually going to be preaching through the first 19 verses this morning. So let's get ready and um, bring it to the Lord in prayer. Dearest Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to preach. May you be glorified. May the church be encouraged this morning to pray, be faithful under prayer even more, and be gathered together on their knees and see how you answer prayer. I bring nothing this morning but, you know, a few bread and a few fishes. May you feed us all this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 It says that the early church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread. There's three words that are missing at the end of that verse. Does anyone know what that is? Pastor Tesh can answer if he wants. Acts 2.42. And in prayer. The one thing missing at the end of that verse to which the early church continued but to which the church today does not, is and in prayers. Why do so few in the church gather together, um, us together, at the throne of grace in prayer? For the individual Christian, um, steadfast prayer is growing absent, and I believe this flows into or is an outflow from the absent prayers of the church. Now, in some time and places, for various reasons, the local church may be hindered from proclaiming the gospel and preaching the word, but the church can always pray. The church can always pray. Prayer is the church's most formidable weapon. It is the church's avenue to God's throne to know and do the will of God in Christ Jesus. Whatever attack or adversity the church faces, prayer is where we ought to start and prayer is where we ought to finish. You have there in Ephesians chapter 6 at the end the the spiritual armour. And some people say that, you know, the secret peace is there in verse 18, prayer praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints, for all saints. Now we look to our passage today here in Acts chapter 12 where the political um, persecution and pressure started to build in earnest. Martyrdoms, imprisonments became frequent. Yet we see the persecuted church became the passionately praying church. That's what I've titled my sermon today, the passionately praying church. Today, I want to see what happens when the church prays. We're going to read Acts um, 12, 1 and 2 again as we start. And my first point this morning is the persecution of the church, the persecution of the church. Acts 12, 1. Now, about that time, Herod, the king, stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So here we have a bit of background before we get into the crux, the meat of our message this morning. And we see that Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, 
This account starts with the words about that time. Now, what he's actually doing here is referring back to the events at the end of Acts chapter 11, detailing the famine that was going on in Jerusalem at the time, um, where the church at Antioch had sent relief by the hands of Paul and Barnabas. Now, um, extra biblical literature and historical evidence shows us that um, this famine occurred around 46 to 47 AD under the Emperor Claudius. And we're told here in Acts 12 that we're looking here at Herod Agrippa I, um, part of the Herodian dynasty. Many of these men ruled over Judea as a governor or a tetrarch over this region um, with the power of Rome behind them. Now, the thing is, is that, as I said, the famine occurred in Acts chapter 11 there in 46 to 47 AD, and Herod Agrippa I actually ruled in Jerusalem from 41 to 44. So this chapter here in Acts chapter 12 is like an interlude, or it's a parenthesis that happens um, actually um, before the events of the previous chapter. And this is quite strange for Luke to do. Because when he wrote his gospel and when he writes Acts, he's um, very diligent to present an accurate account of the events, peoples and places surrounding the Lord Jesus Christ and the early church. And if you're into apologetics, Acts and the gospel of Luke are very good um, historical eyewitness evidence pointing to the truth of Christ. Now, I don't want to go on a bit of a tangent about that, but this is important because Luke writing this account here out of chronological order, as he would do, was for encouraging the early church and for us to see today what happens when the church prays. Now, persecution up to this time was mostly religiously motivated and it was at the hands of their own Jewish brethren. A lot of the early church were all believing Jews and a lot of the persecution came from unbelieving Jews. But before long, the political persecution started to mount from Rome as the gospel of Christ spread throughout the Roman Empire. And so Herod takes advantage of the opportunity to please his subjects and he stretched forth his hand in persecuting and um, mistreating the believers. It said he stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. This means he afflicted, he oppressed, um, and we see that the persecution came upon certain unnamed members of the church, leading to the martyrdom of James, the apostle, um, brother of John the Apostle. And James here, sadly, um, but by God's will, becomes the first apostle to be glad graduated to glory, to die for the cause of Christ, as Christ promised he would do so in Mark chapter 10. Now, Luke doesn't actually elaborate too much on that event, event why he took James or how, um, nor elaborates on the further oppression that was going on there in Jerusalem or on the church. Yet he does focus on a certain event to encourage us this morning, and that's the rescue of Peter from the same fate as James. So we move from the persecution of church to now Peter the prisoner. Peter the prisoner. Let's read verses 3 and 4. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quartonians of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, the first thing that we notice here about Peter is that he was in prison, um, and this didn't happen by anything that he did in particular. He broke no Roman, Roman laws. It just seems that he was a pawn in Herod's political game. And so it seems that Herod simply arrested Peter for his own popularity. Now, the apprehension of Peter here overlapped with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we're told, verse 3, intending after Easter to execute him. Now, this word Easter here um, comes from a pagan word, Ishtar. Um, perhaps the translators used it um, to refer to the Romans are worshipping it or whatnot. But the word in the Greek here is actually Pasha. 
It's elsewhere translated Passover. So the event that was going on here is the annual event of Pasha or Passover. And this was the popular term that was to use for the whole continuous eight day festival. First the Passover and then the unleavened bread would follow. Now, the Jewish religious leaders, they hated Christians. They hated Christians very much, but they didn't want to pollute their festival with an execution. All right. They were very um, pious. So Herod had to wait and keep Peter until the festivities had ended. Now, it must have been known to Herod that Peter had escaped prison once before in Acts chapter 5. We know that the apostles had escaped prison miraculously. So we're told here that four squads or four, of four soldiers, four Quartonian, Quartonians, I'm not sure I like that word too much. It's hard to pronounce. Four Quartonians, 16 in total, probably took up shifts of um, six hours each to guard Peter. And we'll find out later in verse six that the way they did this, the soldiers, you'd have one soldier chained on the right. That's your left, my left, your right, and then two at the doors and they would swap in shifts every six hours, 16 in total. Now, Heron was determined to deliver Peter to the chopping block, to please the Jews, to gain popularity. He wanted to prevent his escape. But we're going to see that the chains of Herod are going to be no match for the prayers of the church. So how did the early church respond to the persecution and the imprisonment? We see in verse 5, they made prayer without ceasing. In verse 5, we see the next point, the prayers of the church. And this is where the main part of the message starts. The prayers of the church. Acts 12, verse 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison and praise the Lord for the butts. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Though Herod had the power of Rome behind him, he was no match for the power of God behind the prayers of the church. His physical efforts were far surpassed by the petitions of the saints. We are told here that they prayed without ceasing. This means that it was intense, extended, it was earnest, sincere. An actual similar Greek word is um, used to speak of Jesus' prayer in the Garden of, of Gethsemane in Luke where it says there more earnestly, it's a similar word in the Greek. I'm not going to try and pronounce it. Um, but it has this, um, the implication of pre, um, praying with stretched out passion. It was not superficial prayers to be seen of men, but the church was praying with intense cries unto the Lord. While Herod made the, the prison as secure as possible, the saints prayed as much as possible. As the soldiers took up shifts to guard Peter, the church probably took up shifts to pray for Peter. They would have remembered Jesus' teaching in Luke 18, 1 to 8, about the parable on the persistent widow that men ought always to pray and not faint. And not faint. And so we see in response to the persecution, in response to the imprisonment, that the church employs its most formidable weapon. They got down on their knees and they prayed. They got down on their knees and prayed. And this was not the first time, nor this would be the last time for the early believers in this early church. There was a pattern of prayer when they knew what to do, when they didn't know what to do, when they had something to do, when they had nothing to do, when they faced adversity, when they said goodbye, when they came together, they prayed. They prayed. After Jesus' ascension, they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. The church praised God in prayer after Peter and John's arrest. When they heard that they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. After Paul and Barnabas confirmed the souls and exhorted the new believers in Lystra, and when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting. And then another one, Paul prays with the Ephesian elders before departing to Jerusalem. 
When he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. We individually pray. Spouses pray together. Families pray together. Praise the Lord. But how much does the church pray together? How much does the church pray together? The early church we see here continued steadfastly in prayer. It was a mainstay. Do we have the same zeal as a body of gathered believers as the early church did? Now, it's not a requirement for us to be together to pray. We are a part of the universal church. When we are praying individually, the Lord is hearing all our prayers. We're praying for one another. But we ought to desire to pray with one another. And part of the culture of um, the early church was that most of their time was spent together in houses praying, especially as the persecution arose. And our culture today um, in Australia is very different. We don't face the same persecution. We don't all gather in each other's houses um, as much anymore, but not, why not spend more time together in prayer? Because they were spending time together in prayer, that probably encouraged them to pray even the more. Now, from what I've just gathered here this morning of being here, I've been well encouraged that you are, I think, a praying church. And I don't think that's much coming from me. And I've been much encouraged and I think it is very appropriate how much you pray, you bring your prayer requests during um, the announcements and then you pray as a church in one accord. May I encourage you with this first point of application to reign, remain faithful unto that end, praying unto that accord with one mind as a church unto the Lord. But prayer can happen more. Um, I'm not sure what happens here, but after the morning service finishes, how often do we get up and straight away we start mingling and fellowshipping and there's nothing wrong with that. But what about the time during when the piano's playing, we, we pray the more even just about the word that we've heard and pray about the application and what the Lord would have us do. And what about outside of church? How often do we see one another? When we're with one another, what a blessed time it is to fellowship, but also what a blessed time it is to pray with one another as well. Let us talk with one another and let us be with one another talking to the Lord. No matter the occasion, or the need, we as a church ought to be praying together, not only in church, but outside of church. Pray without ceasing, First Thessalonians tells us. Now, I, know, um, I notice you guys as well, um, you don't have Wednesday night prayer nights, but you have, is it every second Saturday? Uh, no, once a month. Once a month. Oh, we have the Wednesday night prayer nights and I think the, the times of prayer that we have as church to come together are probably one of the most sacred and blessing. I, I love the Wednesday night prayer nights because of prayer. But the question is, is if we're too busy to come together once a week or once a month to pray, are we perhaps too busy? Are we perhaps too busy? But if we are faithful, let us remain faithful and keep gathering together and praying unto the end. Prayer is a blessed privilege. It's a responsibility. Sometimes it is hard work. It takes an engaging of the mind, our soul. We ought to have great reverence for the occasion. But it is one of the most delightful things a Christian and the church can do gathered together, is it not? That's how attitudes and actions should reflect that. And we should, we should gather together often and want to gather together to pray. No matter how insurmountable the trial, no matter how intense the pressure, the most formidable weapon of the Christian and the church is prayer. So now let's see what happens when the church unleashes its most formidable weapon. 
Let's read now where they're in Acts 12. We're going to read verses 6 to 11 and see the provision of God, the provision of God. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands, and the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, bind on thy sandals, and so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith with the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. So the early church facing great odds employed the only tactic that they had. Not knowing what God's answer would be, they persisted. And now we see in these verses, in verses 6 to 11, that God provided It was not time for Peter to be graduated to glory at the hands of the wicked. This would come later. So um, God sends his angel to supernaturally spring him free. And we notice here that the provision of Peter's freedom um, freedom from prison came the night before his execution. In verse 6 it says, When Herod would have brought him forth. Remember there was the eight-day festival. In these eight days, God could have freed Peter at any time. He could have answered the prayers of the church at any time. But sometimes God doesn't answer right away. Sometimes the answer is wait. Sometimes it is no. But why did he make them wait? Why does God not answer right away? Well, sometimes it's that we may be persistent, that we may trust him. And often a lot of times with prayer and situations like this, there's always a lesson that God has for us to learn. And a lot of the time it is to trust him by faith rather than sight. So we see here that God decided to free him on the final night. Peter here is facing execution the next day and we see him here as cool as a cucumber. All right, he's as chill as a Hindu cow. All right, Um, could you any of us here say that we would sleep so soundly the night before our execution? Okay, that an angel would have to come and slap you awake. Peter can actually say this. All right, how could he sleep so soundly when James had been executed? Well, two things, all right? Peter did have a reputation for sleeping when he should have been praying, all right? We saw this in the Garden of Gethsemane. But with my sanctified imagination, I I more think it is now of the positive. I think it doesn't discount that Peter wasn't praying the whole week along with the church and that he was able, able to rest peacefully in God's will, come what may for him. Perhaps he had no anxious or careful thoughts because he casted them upon the Lord. Philippians 4.6. He'll say in his letter as well, um, cast all your cares upon him for he careth for you. Perhaps he already had that attitude like Paul in Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so this is why he could sleep so soundly, I think. But nevertheless, we see that this was a miraculous intervention from God. Not only was the timing perfect before the execution, but it was rescue from a truly inescapable situation unless God had intervened. So light shone in, the angel slapped Peter, then commanded him to rise up, gird himself, follow him. The guards have to have been like kept asleep 
through the whole ordeal, kept asleep by God, just like the angel kept the mouths of the lions um, in the, the lion's den in Daniel. And not only did the chains fall off by their own accord, the gate also opened into the street um, as they passed the two guards. And it says here that Peter was in a dreamlike state. He wist not, meaning he couldn't comprehend what was going on, that it was true, thinking he saw a, vi a vision. He was in disbelief of his whole rescue. Peter, following the angel, made his way out of prison, passed through the streets. The angel's work was complete. There was no word of instruction. There was no fare thee well. The angel left him. Um, and the rest of his movements to his common sense and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And I remember reading that one Puritan um, said that, you know, um, God sent the angel to fetch Peter, but it was the prayers that fetched the angel. And so we see here that the angel was simply sent to liberate Peter from prison in response to the prayers of the church. And we see that the chains of Herod were no match for the prayers of the church. He'd been miraculously delivered. Herod would have no political gain. The Jews would not be satiated by another execution as they were by Jesus. And when we look at this deliverance that is set forth here by God, we see that sometimes he does things so that his answers cannot be denied and all glory can only go to him. This was a supernatural event. This was truly a miracle, like many others that we see in Scripture, especially at this time in the book of Acts, where God is using um, miracles through the apostles um, and other disciples um, to confirm the revelation of God and the new covenant in Christ. Now, however, those such miraculous rescues may be rare today, and perhaps in some instances, it is God's will for us to suffer persecutions and trials, imprisonments, and um, God forbid, martyrdoms. Death for God's glory. But this doesn't mean that we shouldn't pray, but that we should pray all the more. And this doesn't mean that God doesn't answer our prayers in gracious and monumental ways today sometimes in ways that can only be explained by his intervention, good timing or his coincidence. He is in control. Regardless of how he answers our prayers, we ought to be persistent. Persistent in prayer that all glory ought always go to him. What faithfulness of the church to unceasingly pray and what graciousness of our God that he hears our prayers and answers according to his will. So we've seen the persecution, the prisoner, the prayers, the provision. Now I've got another P for you, the persistence of the church, the persistence. Acts 12, I'm going to read verses 12 to 15. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, uh, sorry, the mother of uh, Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. So we see here that one of the principal gathering places of the church in Jerusalem um, seems to be of this a house of the, another Mary um, in um, the early church in Acts, uh, a woman, the mother of John Mark, the writer of the gospel according to Mark. Now, she may have been a woman of wealth or means to offer her house to the church to gather to pray. This is not uncommon, as I said before, um, we've been looking at uh, Philemon, and Philemon, um, we get from that that he was a man who offered his house to the church in Colossae for the um, brethren to gather there. So it was to this house that Peter decided to go to report this miraculous deliverance to find temporary safety from hiding from Herod's 
clutches. And we see that a woman named Rhoda came out to greet Peter. And when she realised it was Peter in her joy, she didn't open the gate, but she ran back inside to announce the good news. And notice that the believers there that were at Mary's house were still gathered together praying. God had answered their prayers. Peter was knocking at the gate and they still prayed. And there was a considerable or a large amount of of them. And look again at the persistence. The multitude of believers wielding the only weapon that they had in this situation. And they were doing it passionately. Would we have the same persistence as them? And notice the reaction. They'd been praying that the Lord would either rescue Peter, give him strength. We're not told what they were praying for. And they could not believe that God had answered their prayers so directly and so dramatically. And so with scepticism, they actually started to accuse this woman of, woman of being mad or out of her mind. And with James being executed and accepting it would be God's will for Peter to suffer the same fate, they were doubtful that it would be God's will for Peter to be rescued as well. But Rhoda, who left in haste, still still, uh, left Peter still standing at the gate. She was adamant that Peter was rescued and he was out there. Um, So the believers, still sceptical, they had to come up with another explanation, saying that it's an angel or a messenger from the Lord or a human messenger. And it was not uncommon for Jewish believers to um, think that we each have a guardian angel. Um, This wasn't unscriptural. There was an angel who protected Jacob from Laban in Genesis 48. You up to 48 yet? Not, uh, you get there. All right. And Daniel had, uh, um, as I mentioned before, an angel that protected him from the lions. And in Matthew 18, there seems to be angels that report the mistreatment of children to the Lord. But really the believers were sceptical, thinking that the news was too good to be true. And I'm sure we've all done this. And we come up with a far-fetched explanation. And it would appear such an absurd situation. The church were persistent in praying right up to Peter, knocking at the door. Yet it seems that they lacked belief that God actually answered. And I have a quote from my own pastor in our Bible college notes we did on Acts many years ago, where he says... God always seems to give us more than we ask and often more than we deserve. God always seems to give us more than we ask and often more than we deserve. Sometimes we're certainly a people of scepticism and unbelief in God's answers to our prayers and his intervention. We pray faithfully, yet we are doubtful that God is faithful in answering We chalk up the supernatural or the intervention or even the coincidence and forget that God is a God of coincidences. He is in control. If if we remember he answers and he is in control, may that encourage us to persist unto the end. Persist in prayer like the early church did. So they finally let Peter move in, um, come in. As we move from the persistence to now my penultimate or my second last point, the proclamation of Peter, the proclamation, verses 16 and 17. But Peter continued knocking and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go show these things unto James, to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place so they let Peter in you would think he must have been very eager to come off the street at this time into safety and of course when he came in they were astonished they were amazed all right Rhoda was not mad she was not out of her mind she was telling the truth to see the the gracious answer of God with Peter free in their midst they were elated they were overjoyed And there was so much noise and hubbub and hullabaloo that Peter couldn't make himself heard. Now, when our pastor wants to make himself heard and needs to get everyone's attention, he says, can I have your attention, please? All right, but Peter didn't do that. All right, he just beckons them to silence 
with his hands like this. And then he was able to proclaim the great provision of God to free him. And I don't want us to miss these next two points. One, it's of the utmost importance that we don't forget to thank God and proclaim to others the great works that he has done, how he has answered our prayers. In the Old Testament, there are many warnings to Israel to remember the works of his hands and to give thanks. Beware lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And we're given commands in the New Testament that our prayers are to be coupled with praise and thanksgiving, not forgetting the works of our God. And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. Not only is this a command, but God desires and deserves all the glory. This is the main theme of scripture and creation and everything, that all glory ought to go to God. If we forget to acknowledge the Lord, we, de we deprive him of the glory that he deserves. Also, we may be susceptible over time to forget him, to wander away, to go our own way. Our fervency in prayer may dwindle and possibly our fervency in prayer, we may let it, let it slip and then it may cease. We can be lifted up in our own pride and not trust in the Lord, not come on our knees and humbly come before him and thus bring him shame. We may ruin our testimony. God answered in such a miraculous way so that he could get the glory and Peter was not soon or not quick to forget and make sure that the news is told to James, meaning not James the Apostle, but James the half-brother of Jesus, who was the pastor of the church there in Jerusalem, and also the other brethren before departing. Why? So that God may get the glory, so that others may be thankful and glorify him too, and so that the church may be encouraged to persist in the future, so that they may remember this, that, hey, God answered them. We've seen him answer. Our hindsight is 2020. He will answer now. We ought to persist as we did then. Do we remember to give him thanks and praise? We bring our petitions. We bring our prayers. But how often do we bring our praise and thanks? The church faithfully prayed without ceasing God had done a great work responding so graciously to the prayers of the church. Let us not miss now the second point. This is what happens when the church prays. Remember I said earlier, this is the whole point of this account in Acts chapter 12 here. Why Luke is putting it um, out of chronological order in this story. To show us his readers of the time, to show Christians today. This is what happens when the church prays. God answers. God answers. Now, you may think this is strange, but I am going to conclude looking at the soldier's execution to make one final point and application this morning. So we move from the proclamation to the final, and I think it's the seventh point, the punishment of the soldiers, the punishment of the soldiers. Verses 18 and 19. Now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers that was become of Peter. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea, and there abode. So we see here that the soldiers that guarded Peter, they awoke to great dismay and consternation among themselves that he was gone. These soldiers were well aware of the fact that the punishment for allowing a prisoner to escape um, 
in the Roman times, in their laws, was for those prison guards to have the same punishment exacted upon them. And in this case, it was execution. This would be the same dismay that the Philippian jailer would have later in Acts chapter 16, um, where he nearly takes his own life before that could happen, were it not for Paul interceding. And so thus we see that the Roman guards were sadly put to death at the command of Herod. And so we see this body of soldiers, most likely without Christ, without hope, they finished their life on their knees in execution. We, the body of Christ, we have hope. We have eternal life. In contrast to these soldiers, we ought to live life upon our knees in prayer. Whatever the adversity, whenever the Christian, whenever the church is brought to its knees, is that not the best place for the Christian and the church to be? On their knees. C.H. Spurgeon said, whenever God determines to do a great work, he first sets his people to pray. Now, it's not as if we don't pray God can't work. We don't deprive him of anything if we don't. Um, I know I used depriving God before as a a way for us to understand, but God can do anything regardless of if we pray or not. But he wants us to pray and he wants us to pray always and be vessels in his hands and be a part of his great work. And I don't bring this message to bring down or rebuke or correct, but I want to encourage you how God has worked through the faithful prayers in my life through the church at back home in Fentrigalli. My own salvation is due in part to the prayers, the faithful prayers of the church at Fentrigalli. When I first got saved, um, a brother in the Lord told me that One of the sisters, every Wednesday night at prayer meeting, um, and praise the Lord for them, would bring my salvation as a matter of prayer. And he said that he still had the prayer sheets with my name on it. And I'm sure I think the Sykeses were there at the time and the Teshes, and they were praying for my soul. And here I am, 11, oh no, more than that, 13 years later, saved and preaching at Bass Coast. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. And that's because the church faithfully prayed for my soul. God answered. And we know that God will continue to do so in the future. And this is really the point. The prayers of the church today may not lead to such a miraculous deliverance, as I said before. But they have worked and certainly will work to the salvation of souls from hell today. And even if we persisted in prayer here at Bass Coast, Fentrugali, at Oasis, Morwell, um, Maui, Maui, I was meant to say Maui, regardless, some of the other faithful churches that I've been to and preached at, even if we all prayed for decades and only one soul came to Christ, all those prayers would be worth it for that one soul, that one lost sheep. It has been said that what Satan fears most is a man upon his knees. How much more does Satan fear when the church is gathered upon their knees? Let us come together at prayer meeting, on that Sunday, during your announcements, after the service, when we're together outside of church, Let us keep praying without ceasing and see what happens when the church prays. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Let us pray. Dearest Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. What encouragement and what a great anecdote and story of the early church that they unceasingly prayed for those eight days and shifts at that house 
and they saw the miraculous deliverance of Peter. We pray, Lord, that we would be like that early church, that we would gather together, that we would gather by ourselves, with our friends, with our families, and that we would live our life on our knees, that we would go forth on our knees. And we ask, Lord, that you would answer our prayers dramatically, directly, and miraculously, and that, Father, all glory would go to you. We're praying for souls. There's people that we want saved and we're witnessing to. We pray that our prayers and our testimony would just be a part, seeds in that. and We, we would see those souls saved. And we would reap a harvest. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. Thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. The Lord bless you.